Good to have you back for our 231st episode of uh, Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. And we're broadcasting live again from our transcultural uh, triumvirate triangle, although we're currently missing one leg, who is uh, DeSoto Brown, who is rushing to his Bishop Museum, and we don't want him to repeat his legendary rollover in his bug beetle back then. So drive safe to Soto and we will speak on behalf of you because we can't add you to the show while it started. But the other location we have is with our uh, legendary uh, um, legacy leisure legend, Ron Lindgren in his Long Beach, California. Hi, Ron, good to have you back. Hello, Martin, it's great to be back. Good. And with me, would you wish so back in uh, Munich, Germany, and uh, talking about uh, mid-February, our temperature is a little weird, because only in Honolulu, it's where it's supposed to be in the, I think, 80s or in the low 80s. And you have what? 90 degrees. Uh, looking forward to a very hot Super Bowl Sunday. All right, and we have 55 here, which is too warm for mid-February. It's supposed to be cold here. So something is going on, which might be, unfortunately, climate change. So um, we're going to wrap up, uh, Ron, um, basically critiquing the most recent uh, high-rise um, rental development in Waikiki, and which prides itself to be the first one in two decades. And for that, let's get the first slide up because uh, what else has happened ever since uh, last week, last week's show? On the top right, what is that? We have our consultant, our exotic escapism expert uh, having an event, right, Ron? Yes, uh, we have uh, someone who's just had a birthday, uh, a happy belated birthday. Uh, and uh, she, in the upper right, uh, she is shown leaning out over, over one uh, balcony lanai, about uh, balcony railing, and I'm leaning out over another, and we were both enjoying the charms of the islands. Yeah, and this is the Kahala Hilton, which is the heyday of your, uh, your fantastic work on the islands by your business partner and friend, uh, Ed Killingsworth. And... Um, Suzanne's name, actually, when you look it up, it actually means Lily. Surprise, surprise. That's where it comes from, uh, name-wise, origin-wise. And that is how they named this project we're reviewing, because they say here it was Queen Emma's favorite flower. We um, have been going through and basically checking the building in its uh, bones and doing a checklist and gave it... Um, good marks for basically typology because it is a rental and not another hospitality design, which we have enough uh, in Waikiki and we need uh, rentals so badly. Um, we also said its, uh, its orientation is in the right direction, principally running Malka Makai. And it's, the fenestration is principally not too bad because it's not an entirely hermetic glazed building. It has lanai's. But then when you look deeper into it, uh, we had some criticism. And uh, the pictures at the bottom uh, basically uh, are me making up for correcting what I've said, because I'm still working on uh, the conversion of um, inch and, and meters uh, on, on metric and the other one. And as Iran said, only any, if you work for gov on government projects, you needed the metric. Otherwise, you guys got, got stuck. Uh, with the inches. So what I meant to say is that my uh, Waikiki Grand Lanai, which you see on the left, has is probably like three to four feet, so 1.2 meters approximately, while the ones on the bottom right, uh, which are our treetop apartments here back in Germany, are significantly deeper. They're up to like, um, you know, um, two meters, which is approximately six feet. And you were, you were saying, Ron, that only that qualifies it to be a real lanai, right? If it has sufficient width. Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that lanai is actually an out, a room that is outdoors large enough to furnish. Anything less than that to me is just a Romeo and Juliet balcony whose only purpose is to provide a place to turn around and wash the glass or at the Lilia, 
to tinker around with the through wall air conditioning units, which are rather distressingly uh, visible. That was part of the design of, of, the, uh, of this uh, apartment complex. And that sort of wavy, continuous uh, balcony, again, is not, uh, does not create lanai spaces as we would like to see all people in Hawaii be able to enjoy. Yeah, and for that, let's go to the second slide. And our producers, Max and Michael, magically, uh, wizardly brought De Soto in. So he didn't roll over again on H1. So we're happy. Hi, De Soto. Good morning. Hello. Good to have you back. OK, Ron, so since we kicked off with this in our volume one, and I did it on my own on behalf of us last week, Ron, please share with us your additional observations above and beyond what we had said uh, when we look at the building here at its entirety again. Yeah, uh, one of the things uh, about uh, the LIA that makes it so important is that it is, as Martin had said earlier, in decades, there, there just haven't been uh, any rental apartments, uh, new rental apartments available. And here there are well over 400 that will be available. Questionable whether they're affordable. Uh, small uh, uh, units that uh, really are just a studio go for a little over 2,000 a month. One bedrooms, one bath go for uh, in the mid 2000s. And then the two bedroom units, and there are quite a few of those, uh, go for just slightly under $3,000. $3,000 seems to be the number not to cross in Honolulu right now for a two bedroom unit. And we're looking at high-rise uh, living, both to buy and to rent. And uh, we'll be talking a lot more next week about just the costs of uh, you know, single-family housing in the United States and what a crisis that is. Uh, affordability, it's, it's, it's really sad to realize that many uh, people in the lower income levels spend so much on their rent every month because it's just that expensive uh, that uh, what they have left over after they've paid those rather large rents is maybe four or five hundred dollars for the rest of the entire month. That's really tough. In fact, it isn't enough. It isn't enough to feed a family of four. And, and so food insufficiency grows and that also grows towards homelessness. Uh, Renters all over the United States are facing onerous raises in those rents. In, in fact, just in the third quarter of last year, rents all across the United States jumped up an amazing 10%. And if you were lucky or unlucky enough to be in the Sunbelt states, people uh, there in cities uh, are paying 18, even up to 28% more this year for rent than they did last year. And those in Miami, amazingly enough, had a year-for-year -year increase in rent of 49%. Uh, that's way above any of these problem, uh, problems we're having with all expenses getting larger and larger. Uh, this is beating that to the punch. And yeah. the housing crisis is more and more a serious problem. And we'll be talking more about that next week. Yeah. And the, the rental rates here, they're a little bit quiet about them. I think the ones you mentioned might actually be the one I think you said about the residences at Bishop Place in, in, in downtown Honolulu, which we will have to talk about too. And uh, but so on the internet, you don't quite find much, but I think you're the you DeSoto, you remember that somewhere in the press there was criticism about these not that affordable as they wanted to pretend, right? Is that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that, is, that is very much the case. And in fact, uh, people complained a lot in letters to the editor of the newspaper about how it was just a token amount of um, places were available in this building, one, and two, that they really aren't that affordable. And when you get down to how expensive they are, as Ron just said, so... On one hand, yeah, there is some affordability, but on the other hand, uh, even though it's not a luxury condo, it's not that easy to move into it if you don't have a huge amount of money. Yeah. So let's go to the next slide and look at the building again. 
Although, is it the same building? No, that is the that's the supposed Princess Cut Yulani. That's the building that uh, has been uh, discussed as being potentially destroyed, and all three of the of the buildings on the site being replaced by one new condo. But we're going to be talking more about the Princess Cut Yulani and the importance of Lanai's as we go through this. Yeah, and we intentionally took the took the picture from the same kind of angles. So this is the parallel street, uh, Kalakaua Avenue, uh, while the Lilia is on Kuhio. And on the next slide, there's something really interesting to see as a de-evolution of what you just said, Solo, right? Absolutely. So if we look at this, these three buildings from left to right, the building on the far left is the 1960 tower that's part of the three tower complex of the Princess Kaiulani. And the important thing here is look at the depth of those lanais. They are, as Ron was just saying, akin to being a separate room of the same size, comparable size to what would be indoors behind the sliding doors. The next building in the center is one of the Outrigger hotels built as part of the Outrigger chain, opened in about 1970. And you can see in that 10 year span how the Lanais are now tiny. They're at an angle, so they're not exactly comparable, but we've gone from deep wide ones to skinny ones, which are just kind of an afterthought. And then finally in the distance is this new Lilia. And of course on the side facing towards us, there aren't any Lanais at all. And on the side that is uh, parallel to the other two buildings, we see those wavy or sort of um, angular zigzag lanais, which provide a little visual interest. But as, as Ron just said, they barely qualify, if at all, for the term lanai because they're just little skinny platforms on which you've also got your exterior air conditioning unit. So you don't have a lot of room there. Yeah, and the middle building, which you said the outrigger, that is architect as the developer, Roy Kelly, who used to work for the architect of your childhood, DeSoto, uh, Vladimir Asipov, and then went on his own with his wife and started to be uh, a hotel developer and, and right. his design skills to design them. So he's to be blamed. Usually, you, Ron said, we say, you know, the architect doesn't play the role anymore, but back then, in, in this case, big times. And let's go to the next slide which we uh, see illustrated what you just already said, uh, Ron, because there's a similarity uh, here about half a century ago that the attempt was to make the Lanai's interesting. So they gave it this wavy curvilinear uh, to it. And the Lilia has the kind of the zigzaggy. And we also throw in the show quotes that we did about the, uh, the Princess K Hotel. And the one at the top left um, uh, reminds us that uh, these, um, you know, hotel chains or developers of apartment buildings like to schmooze with the royals because they name their projects after them here, uh, literally. And you, you once said this is odd because this isn't really even the location where her estate was, but it's further away. And That's in the right. case of the Lelia, it's odd as well because. Besides the name dropping, they don't really make any reference to, you know, what what does the flower have to do with the project? So it seems to be pretty much sales pitching in both cases. We don't want to uh, basically uh, forget to say that we hope that this project here, uh, the Princess K, is going to stay because there's this, which we think a pretty uh, sad proposal to replace it with something that we were elaborating on in that show that isn't any bigger or better or anything. So we were saying, what's the point? If we go to the next slide, this clearly shows, um, we took this picture um, at that perfect time of the day when you see the performance of these lanais. Uh, you see it with these shadow angles there, triangles, and you see that not only is the uh, glass sliding fenestration that could overheat uh, been in the shade, but also part of the lanai is in the shade, which is even better because then you can actually, only then you can really use the lanai outside. So a really good example, but again, this is two buildings down the road. Did they not look at that? Obviously not, right? It's so obvious, it's there. 
And uh, along the same line, go, go to the next slide, and you, uh, DeSoto, tell us about the history of these buildings. Well, the building on the top is one of what was called the Ebb Tide Apartments Hotels, and they were developed very quickly, 1959 and 1960, and inexpensively, and the purpose was to sell the individual units to individual owners who would then let the company rent them out or use them as hotel rooms, and so this is basically a quick and dirty building from that time period, uh, but it does have those really deep lanai's. And as you can see in this picture, it was in the process of being renovated. That particular Waikiki Eptide business model ended up not being successful. People really didn't make money. So it was not, it was kind of a, not a get rich quick scheme, but it was something to sell to people in the euphoria and excitement of the building of uh, the, the building boom of statehood. In the lower left corner, we see the new Lilia building, but we also see here in the on the right, uh, one of the old low buildings of this time period of the old days. And this building was built in 1948. And of course, it's easy breezy. It has absolutely no air conditioning, but it's also got uh, this very wonderful touch of individually made unique railings, which have a breadfruit or ulu tree theme. So the leaves on there are all custom made. And on a low budget building, this is something you could never even think about doing today, but it was affordable back at the time when this was built, again, in the post-war boom in 1948. Yeah, also it's uh, it's a late entry to a show we once did that was called uh, Crazy Cantilevering Canopies. Look at the, the, how much that is cantilevering out as to provide what we need in the tropics, protection from the sun and the rain, which the Lilia is unfortunately doing insufficiently. And going back to the top building here, uh, while it hasn't, might not have been successful, as you said, uh, DeSoto as a business model, but it's been successful in, in other ways. For example, is it something that the Lilia prides itself to be mixed use? But mixed use is basically that the grocery store stays on the ground level and all the retail, and then there is all the living above it. In this building here, while bicycling by, I, I noticed um, and found it interesting that there were actually businesses stratosphering into the, into the top stories. And I found this particularly interesting. And the building is oriented the right way. It's facing uh, north and east, and the lanais are deep enough. And as you said, it's Soto, that was just the way to do it. One was generous, even in very sort of dry cut developments like that. This is not a, this is not an exclusive development, right? That's rather Correct. quick and dirty and cheap, but uh, it was generous as far as that lanai's were just the attitude of the time. And yes. now at this point, we took this picture about four months ago. Um, it seems it was under remodeling. Uh, it's indicated because they boarded it up. And this boarding it up uh, gets us to the next slide. So we, here we see the Lilia's uh, plinth, uh, the retail plinth under construction, and it's boarded up as well. And we kind of find it ironic that the material, of course, these sheets of plywood aren't local. They're shipped in from the mainland likely, but wood we have on the island, and we've been talking a lot about how one could reinvigorate uh, sort of a wood um, industry on the islands. But here it's only used for these temporary purposes of construction or hurricane protection or COVID boarding up as you uh, did pictures to Soto where they didn't want the vandals to you know, break into the stores. While the invasive stuff uh, as glass and, and other materials, they're not from here, they have to be shipped in and labor, uh, they're labor intensive and, and carbon intensive. And so they stay while the wood goes away. And we just wanna to refer to the top uh, show quotes of Tropicare Rookwood who had once with his emerging uh, generations investigated in tropical screens. And they came up with these really impressive uh, uh, wide variety of systems that could fold up and down in, in ways the traditional wood jealousies haven't been doing that. So that's just an encouragement to saying, you know, rethink the way you build 
and uh, and build uh, obviously more tropically uh, exotic as uh, this getting us to the next slide because these are people that we just you know snapshotted while we were doing our scavenger hunting uh, detective work for this show here so these are the people who live there these are residents these are not tourists this mermaid looking woman here with her surfboard and the guy with his boogie board on his surfboard they are the residents of the neighborhoods and looking at these people uh, wouldn't you think they would prefer a lifestyle different than uh, you know, let's face it, the Lilia, you know, even giving it the benefit of doubt and, and, uh, but it's still pretty much the old paradigm of double loaded corridor with, uh, with territorialized rooms. Uh, that is the model of the past century, right, or of the past millennium, we have to say. So wouldn't you think it's time for something new gets us to the next page? And you tell us what it what that might be. <laughs> well, that's one of the uh, that's the latest iteration of the primitiva, and primitivas are the, um, the 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 structures which are proposed by your immersion generation students at UH, and in this particular case, we've got this curling round ever spiraling upwards structure, which is actually open. And we're gonna see how that uh, kind of plays out, what you would be like, what would be like to live in that and what the advantages are of trying this whole new way of living. Yeah, and to the next slide, this is a compilation, a potpourri of show quotes from a show that we were all part of and then you guys can go back and look at it in details. But summarizing is basically uh, addressing what you, Ron, said, the housing crisis, so civility and its threats so, through social inequity is, besides COVID and climate change, the biggest challenge of our times. And this uh, project wants to tackle it in a way to say, do the most with the least. So basically use compression tensile system uh, versus uh, tensile systems here versus compression. Uh, you know, don't do these costly facades that just uh, basically, as you, Ron, call it, refrigerate buildings, because otherwise, as I call it, you get microwaved in them. So all these things uh, basically value engineer in the best sense of the term and not the corrupted one that it unfortunately has gotten down to. So um, uh, next slide, which is second to last, uh, we're sort of wrapping up with a couple of minutes left. So where does Cohio end on the Diamond Hand side where it, where it meets Kapahulu? This is in our hood. You do, do sort of look down on that from your place. I look over it from the side and explain where and what that is. Well, that is the school. That's the Jefferson School that is uh, right at the end of the Alawai Canal as well. And what you've got here is a proposal to turn that into a cluster of Primitiva three cones or pointy things, which actually are not just pointy things. They are interior spirals and they're open on the sides and et cetera, and all kinds of wonderful things in there. But that is in reference to Alfred Price, who was a famous architect from your part of the world, from Austria, worked from the 1930s onwards. And this is one of, uh, this is near where his, one of his last commissions was as an architect, which is the entry to the Honolulu Zoo. But one of the things I just want to mention too, in Alfred Price's case, he also was the architect of the Arizona Memorial at Pearl Harbor. He was one of the instrumental people who started the State Foundation of Culture and the Arts, which is the his whole thing for the rest of the end of his life. And I want to thank him for that because that's how I got hired at Bishop Museum 30 plus years ago through a grant that SFCA gave to Bishop Museum and that funded me for the first two years and enabled me to make that my lifetime career. So thank you, Alfred Price. I pay homage to you. Absolutely. And the irony is when he got the Arizona Memorial and the entrance to the zoo, which is right over, these were the last commissions he ever got. And he then reinvented himself uh, and became instrumental in policy making. And the policy here was that he 
um, put in place that you can obstruct um, of the view of Diamond Head with ordinary high rises, but we would think as he looks mildly down on it, that he would have approved this because primitivas aren't really buildings, they're living organisms, little mountains themselves. And Laura McGuire just did an exhibit about him and the presentation that you attended the Soto. Yes. And let's go to the final slide here because um, the Lilia, we think in summarizing um, had um, opportunities, but it didn't quite step up to these. And uh, we believe they might have stopped at this point, what you see here, which is the building under construction. And it already provides everything that Primitiva has proposed. Basically, you have the shelter from the sun and the rain, that's all you need. And then you can basically throw in uh, Tropica Rockwoods and his team uh, engineered Tropic here uh, screens, and, and there you go. And on, on some funny notes about these horizontal, you know, uh, ca steel cable guardrails, which are quite, you know, tropical exotic. You once told us to Soto, that's the show quote at the top left, that Thomas Magnum uh, was giving his son, uh, alias Solik, sorry, Tom Selig, alias uh, Thomas Magnum, uh, was giving his son driving lessons in your front yard outrigger canoe club by your architect Asipov, and that didn't quite go so well as well as the Marina City Tower in Chicago has the same guardrails uh, for the parking garage and the Blues Brothers, you know, um, it, it demonstrates, you know, how, can, how you can drive through them. But again, cars are cars and people are people because people are not that heavy. So people wouldn't do that, right? So right. Uh, we're basically encouraging uh, the developers and the architects to uh, be more, um, uh, you know, not just figurative, but literal about. So when you have a flower um, or a plant as your inspiration, then you have to live up to that, not just formally or, you know, sales pitching wise, but inherently performatively. And that basically makes us be at the end of the show only to announce that we're going to revisit one of these uh, where a developer uh, basically brands it after uh, sugarcane and that one we looked at two and a half years ago when it was under uh, you know proposed uh, but now it's close to be completed and, and that is uh, not a rental project but one where you can buy the units and that will make you Ron elaborate on uh, where we are in America and in the world as far as that home ownership and all the challenges. So until, yeah, so uh, let's see you all for that next week. And until then, please stay uh, literally and figuratively easy breezy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.